can get started. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, this is, as you know, the National Blood Clot Alliance uh, PEP event, our monthly event, Patients Educating Patients. And um, tonight we have a very interesting uh, topic and very interesting people that are joining us for this topic. So tonight's uh, title is How to Adjust, Overcome, and Lower Blood Clot Risk Occurrence and Reoccurrence. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce the speakers and we would like to thank Cardinal Health for being our uh, educational sponsor for this evening. So thank you very much to Cardinal. Um, I have with us, or we have with us tonight, uh, Todd Robertson, who's a board member and PE survivor and my my pet partner on a regular basis. Um, and we have uh, Dr. Rachel Rosofsky, who many of you probably know because she's been an active participant with us since we started our pet program. So uh, Rachel, thank you very much for joining. And just to remind everybody, uh, she is a board certified hematologist at Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, where she provides clinical care full time, supervises trainees and conducts research in the area of thrombosis and hemostasis. She is uh, an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. She is also the director of thrombosis research and division of hematology uh, and co-chair of Mass General's thrombosis committee. Uh, she earned her undergraduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania her medical degree from Harvard Medical School and her master's in public health from Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, and she completed her residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Fellowship in Hematology and Medical Oncology uh, at the combined Dana-Farber Cancer Institute of Mass General Hospital program. Um, Rachel, thank you again for joining us and uh, sharing all of your wisdom with us. Um, and tonight we have a, uh, a new participant who is joining us. Uh, Dr. Amy Rapkowitz, who we will either call uh, Amy or Dr. Rapp. Uh, Dr. Rapp, thanks for joining us uh, this evening as well. Um, so Amy is uh, actually the current Deputy Chief Medical Examiner of the Suffolk County Medical Examiner's Office in Suffolk, uh, New York. She is also the uh, Chair of uh, and Autopsy Director of the Medical Laboratory Director at NYU Long Island Hospital. Uh, she has her um, medical uh, degree from SUNY Downstate Cum Laude. She did her Bachelor of Arts at NYU. Um, her postdoctoral training uh, at a multitude of places, uh, anatomic pathology residency at the National Institute of Health National Cancer Center. Um, uh, she is the uh, did forensic pathology fellowship at the Miami-Dade County Medical Examiner. Um, and she also uh, Harvard Macy Faculty Scholar Program for Educators and Health Professionals. Uh, she has several decades of experience uh, and has some very interesting uh, information to share with us this evening um, on blood clots. So with that, we are actually going to start off on our polling. And uh, so before we get started, we're going to have some short poll questions, which Todd is actually going to uh, walk us through and share the results. So Todd, can I send it over to you. Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, popped up on your screen, everybody. There's just four questions. Won't take long. We do this because we want to get to know what you need, what you think, uh, you know, what you're after as far as information. So question number one, did your provider ever discuss blood clot recurrence with you? Yes, no, not sure, not available. Number two, how soon after being diagnosed did you receive information about recurrence? Zero to 30 days, 30 to 90 days, 90 to 180 days, 180 days plus. How about I did not receive any information at all about recurrence? Question three, what prevention methods have you utilized after your diagnosis? Compression, strict medication adherence, healthier lifestyle, exercise, or other? And then the final question, what forms of prevention are you interested in learning more about? Compression, medication adherence, healthier lifestyle, or exercise. So if you guys wouldn't mind just uh, quickly going through and marking your choices, then we're going to take a look at the results. I do want to thank everybody for doing this, because like I said, this is how we learn about uh, how you're being treated, what, what information is being given to you, um, what you are looking for, what, what do you need. Uh, this and all the surveys that we throw out there are really important. So that's why we appreciate it when you guys fill these surveys out and take these polls, um, because uh, we, it's just something that we uh, want to know about you. So once the results pop up, so here we go. Did your provider ever discuss blood clot recurrence with you? 51% said yes. 
46% said no, so kind of even there, not sure, 3%. Our second question, how soon after being diagnosed did you receive information about recurrence? 31% uh, said zero to 30 days. 17% said 30 to 90 days. 6% said 90 to 180 days. And 3% uh, said 180 uh, plus days. 43%. Uh, and uh, this is where we need to try to change things for you guys. I did not receive any information about recurrence at all. Uh, what prevention methods have you utilized after your diagnosis? Compression, 57%. Uh, we had 83% say strict medication adherence. That's very important. Healthier lifestyle, 43%. Exercise, 49%. And 11% said other. And the final question, what forms of prevent, uh, prevention are you interested in learning more about? 54% said compression, medication adherence, 49%, healthier lifestyle, 71%, exercise, 71%. What this is showing is we, people just wanna know a lot about a lot of different things. So uh, thank you very much for taking the poll. Now we're gonna have a two question poll at the very end. So don't sign out and go away from pep talk until you do that, but that'll be at the end of the show. Leslie Lake, take it away. Thanks, Todd. So that's a little bit disconcerting that people aren't getting uh, information on recurrence. So we know there's a gap in information there that we can share with clinicians and uh, hopefully uh, close that gap. Okay, so uh, tonight's topic, as I said, is how to overcome and lower the risk and recurrence of uh, blood clot occurrence. Um, so one of the ways that we can do this uh, is to lead a healthier lifestyle, which incorporates things like exercise, better sleep, hydration, maintaining a healthy weight. Um, for those of you that know, know me, you know my story. For those of you that don't, um, my weight loss story is uh, I'm an unprovoked PE patient. Um, there was never a discussion about me losing weight. And um, uh, basically, after I had my PE, I went on a personal health campaign and I lost 60 pounds. Um, unfortunately for me, it's a little bit like this and I have a tendency to gain back and then lose and then gain back and lose. So I'm, I'm in that camp of, uh, it does get frustrating sometimes, but we know that obesity plays a really strong role with regard to getting a blood clot. Um, but we, we, as patients may not know why that is. And so Rachel, we'd like to start with you this evening, uh, to talk about this, you know, obesity is a term that gets thrown around a lot, but you know, what does it actually mean? How should we be thinking about it? Why is it a contributing risk factor for getting a blood clot? What's the link? So we're going to turn it over to you now. Okay, let me share my screen here. Let's see. All right. So um, I just, uh, I always say my disclosures when I talk at all, but none of them have to do with anything um, for this talk. Uh, but I just, let's just take a step back for a little bit. And I think everybody on this call knows that you know, pulmonary embolism in VTE is a, is a major problem. And we know for world thrombosis day, one in four people worldwide are dying of conditions can cause by clots. And Leslie is well aware of this from the CDC that 900,000 men, women, and children every year are affected by blood clots with 100,000 people dying from them, which means one every six minutes. And we know more people are dying of a pulmonary embolism than breast cancer, cancer car crashes and AIDS. And uh, it is the number one cause of preventable deaths in hospitalized patients in the United States. If we merely just actually give those people prophylactic anticoagulation, we can save a lot of lives. And the cost is pretty enormous, you know, seven to $10 billion a year. And this problem is not going, uh, going away. Um, this was an analysis of all these, what's called healthcare claims data over a five-year period, which aimed to kind of estimate what the prevalence of VTE is over time. And this was based on about uh, over 12 million eligible patients. And they found that the risk, the prevalence of VTE increased by 33% over that five years. So it's projected that the adults with VTE, the prevalence is going to more than double by the year 2050, which is crazy. And we also know that as people get older, your, your risk increases. When you're in your 20s, the risk is about one in 10,000. And when you're in your 80s, it's about one in 100. Wow. And when we look at the causes, so this is a study out of uh, Minnesota where the, the authors wanted to know what the annual incidence rate of VTE was and to look at the risk factors and then to trend those over time. And they found that almost 80% of the, the events were attributable to some known risk factor like age, hospitalization, surgery, cancer, trauma. And interestingly, in one third of the cases where they couldn't identify the cause, 
over 33% of those people, it was attributed to their weight. And over time, they found that the, the, the increase, um, the prevalence of obesity and severe obesity increased dramatically for both men and women. So clearly, obesity is a major healthcare crisis. And so just to give you some definitions, so obesity, we, we define obesity by something called a body mass index. And so we take a patient's weight in relation to their height, and we calculate it kilograms divided by what's called the square meter of their height. And a BMI greater than 30 is considered obese, and a BMI greater than uh, 40 is considered severe obesity. Um, and we know that obesity, like I said, is a major um, healthcare problem, and it's, it's really reaching um, a crisis proportion. So here is, um, you can see here that this was looking at obesity um, over time, and you can see that the, it's increased steadily over a decade. So if you look at 1999 to 2000, about 30% of the population was considered obese. And then from 2017, 2018, it was 42%, so it increased by 12%. If you look at severe obesity, it went from about 5% to almost 10%. And so it's thought that they, uh, by the end of this decade, nearly 50% of uh, 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 adults in the United States will be obese. Now, these graphs were a little bit shocking for me. So this is, I just wanna show it to you kind of in a more visual way. This is the prevalence of self-reported obesity among adults by state and territory. They started in 2011, they went to 2021. And green means that less than 25% of the population is obese and yellow is 25 to 30. Orange is 30 to 40%. And red indicates that more than 40% prevalence of obesity in uh, adults in the United States. So watch how this prevalence changes over time. This is 2011, and in particular, watch the colors. See, it's mostly green and yellow right here, a little bit of orange, no red. This is 2013. This is 2015. This is 2017. This is 2019. And this is 2021. So you can see here, there's only one green state and a handful of yellow states indicating that there's been a significant increase in the prevalence of obesity in every state over time. Um, and so just this is a, an incredibly visual way to kind of look at what's happening to the country and that this really is a healthcare crisis. So we know that more than 650 million adults are affected worldwide. And like I said, no state or territory had a prevalence of obesity less than 20%. And up to about 70,000 extremely obese patients in the United States with BTE um, will require treatment with a blood thinner. So Leslie asked me, you know, what is, how does obesity increase the risk of VTE? And Amy, I think is gonna get into this um, in greater detail, but essentially obesity produces kind of a low grade inflammatory state. And there's lots of reasons for that. Kind of the, the vessels get damaged, which promotes clotting. The platelets, we call them, they get angry. They, they become very reactive. That promotes platelets. And we have what's called um, increased a hypercoagulable state where several of the clotting factors get revved up with obesity. And then when you, you know, there's kind of a delicate balance with clotting in our, in our bodies. There's bleeding and clotting that happens all the time. So for example, if you cut yourself, your clotting system kicks in to make a blood clot. But then what's called your thrombolytic or your anti-clotting system kicks in to just make sure the blood clot stays in that one place. And obesity, uh, there's impaired uh, what's called thrombolysis. So you're not able to break down the clot as well. So all these changes translate into an increased risk um, of blood clots. And then on top of that, you can have other risk factors. Maybe you're hospitalized, maybe you're pregnant, maybe you're on oral contraceptives with estrogen, maybe you're immobile, maybe you broke a leg. Uh, maybe you're going to fly to Australia. And so those are other factors that can contribute uh, to the risk of, um, of blood clots. So what can you do? I think it's really important that, you, that we, you're, you're here, which is amazing. You're here to learn about this and really understand the risks associated with obesity, learn about the additional risk factors I mentioned. And it's really important to talk with your provider about your potential risk, especially in these other clotting risk situations. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about this, about kind of the healthy lifestyles, exercise, um, uh, uh, hydration, sleeping, um, stress reduction, healthy diet. And I also think, um, you know, it's also really important. I mean, you cannot have uh, a PEP without, without talking about 
knowing signs and symptoms of a blood clot and not ignoring them. I can't tell you how many patients yeah. I get where they were like, yeah, I had this, you know, I was short of breath for five days and I couldn't even walk up a flight of stairs and people are like, oh, I was tired or, oh, I didn't get enough sleep or, oh my God, I'm just out of shape and just really don't uh, make those excuses. And then definitely talk with your provider. If you've got a blood clot, how you might, long late you might need to be on blood thinner. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but in high clotting situations, how you can decrease your risk. So I'm going to stop my slide sharing there. If I can. Rachel, quick question for you before we move forward. Yeah. Is there any difference between um, BMI for men versus women? Um, well, Amy, do you want to answer theory? that? So. In general, as women get older, their BMI increases. Um, and then men typically not as much as women as they get older. So usually the um, changes in BMI sort of level out and become more parallel as men and women get older. It's kind of all over the map slightly depending on ethnicity and height and, and genetics. Um, but there's sort of like a switch between men having a higher BMI, usually because of higher muscle mass earlier in life, and then women sort of tend to increase as they go older. Um, but, yeah. you know, as body mass is changing, as Rachel just showed over over the years, um, there's not as much of a difference between them. But the definitions, I think if you were asking about the definitions, they're the same. The definitions. Yeah. There's the not same. a different definition. Okay. But Amy right, will get thanks. into this too, because if you have a lot of uh, muscle mass, you might be in the obese category, even though you might have <laughs> less than 5% fat on your body. And, so exactly. Just, and I was just wondering if women, you know, are, do they have a, uh, are men more predisposed or are women more predisposed to it because of their uh, body mass being slightly different? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I, I don't know, Rachel, if you have any yeah. other... No, okay. I think I think there's a lot of different com you know factors that can contribute to it. Um, uh, that's been looked at a, a lot. Um, so, um, uh, but not that, but not in particular do I know about. Okay, all right, Todd. Yeah, and, and thanks for that, Rachel, and thanks for mentioning uh, the contributing factor portion of that because it's oftentimes not one thing that's causing your blood clot. Right, it's not just the one risk factor. It can be a perfect storm. And I'll get to that in just a second, but uh, just real quickly, as a blood clot survivor, I, I uh, have been in a, you know, my own weight loss journey over the last year. Um, I lost 60 pounds in the past 12 months, and it was not always easy. But if you were to look at that BMI scale right now and my weight, technically, I'm still obese, right? I'm, I'm still 15 pounds over my goal weight, but I've been going to the gym a lot too, so I've added on 10 or 12 pounds of muscle, so it's it's been, you know, it's a fine line and it's really confusing, mm -hmm. but I think, um, you know, one of the things uh, that worked for me was I, I saw a nutritionist and, and I learned to, I adopted a different behavior when it came to my eating habits. And it wasn't just about eliminating what I loved because I still eat what I love, but it's been more of the portion control and, and also eliminating a lot of that processed sugar intake. But um, you know, it's been up and down like we were talking. I, I lose pounds, I go up, and now I've hit that weight loss plateau to where it's really easy for somebody to get frustrated because, well, I'm doing the same thing I was. How come I'm not losing weight? So, you know, it, it, it's a good thing to see a nutritionist too. And I throw that out there just because um, I went through that. Um, so talking about the contributing factors real quick, my mom uh, died sudden death right in front of me back in 1984. Um, I was still a teenager. There wasn't a whole lot of talk about blood clots and even obesity back, back then, but she was extremely obese, but that wasn't the only reason she had, that was just a contributing factor like you were talking about. Uh, she led, led a, a sedentary lifestyle. She was a smoker. Um, she had a lot of different risk factors, plus she was factor five Leiden. So you were talking about that, you know, the clotting disorders increases that risk too when you're obese. Um, but Amy, I'm, I'm so glad that you're here. Um, and I have, I have something for you. So as a pathologist who has seen, you know, the psychological impact of obesity on thrombosis uh, mortality, can you share with us maybe some anatomic considerations when thinking about obesity? And is BMI, we talked a little bit about it, but is BMI created equal 
or is there a better way for us to be thinking about that? You are coming at it from a little bit different angle uh, than Rachel is, but it seems we are all arriving at the same location. Obesity plays a strong role in thromboembolism. Yes, for sure. Um, would now be my time to share my slides? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Thank you, uh, everyone, for having me. I'm, I'm really uh, excited to speak to you. It's very nice to be allowed to get out of the lab and, and talk to living patients. Um, so today, are, are my slides showing okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. So as mentioned, you know, I deal mostly with sort of the anatomic or the visual representation of disease in patients. Many of the people that I see, unfortunately, are similar to um, Todd's mom, where they're sudden unexpected deaths. And, you know, in large scale studies of those deaths, many, you know, we see up to about 30% of those deaths have pulmonary thromboembolisms. And in those percentages, I would have to say another 30%, one of the contributing factors is obesity. Granted, we don't always know a large amount of information about those patients, but it is one of our very large contributing factors that we see in patients that have deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. So I'd like to draw your attention here just to, to sort of help you visualize where the deep veins are in the legs. And I will be showing some anatomic and autopsy images. There will be trigger warnings on the bottom right-hand side of the screen, just so you know. The deep veins of the legs run sort of in the back middle aspect of the legs. They're sort of large caliber veins that help bring blood from your feet all the way back up to your heart and into your lungs. The most common sources of deep vein thrombosis that sort of stem the development of pulmonary thromboembolism are usually in the lower extremities. They are not exclusively in the lower extremities. We also see them not uncommonly in pelvic veins, typically in women who have maybe had multiple births or different types of surgeries or other um, risk factors associated with varicose veins, not only in the legs, but also inside of the body in the pelvis. Sometimes in the upper extremities, people experience deep vein thrombosis, but it's much more rare and they usually have very significant medical conditions or, on, or are on dialysis. As you see here, you see a person who does have a deep vein thrombus. When a clot or a thrombus is blocking one of those veins, the blood has nowhere to go and the pressure builds up in swelling of those legs. And you can usually see some difference in size. This is not always the case. Many of these are also asymptomatic or you don't see anything at all. And this is just showing sort of when that clot develops in the leg, it can completely occlude the vessel, meanwhile that no blood can get back and even worsen the swelling in the leg or it can have various degrees of stenosis. So when you have a clot in the leg, these are the valves within that vein that helps sort of keep the blood from flowing backwards against gravity. An embolus can occur where a small piece of that clot can break off and travel up through those deep veins through the inferior vena cava, which is also a very deep vein inside of the abdomen, through the heart into the lungs. This is a long way to go and a lot can happen on that route. So not only can you have venous thromboembolism in the lungs, you can also have smaller things that can occur in other organs, but usually they're not symptomatic. Sometimes the entire clot will dislodge and go through. Usually in those situations, clinically, this patient may present with some sort of symptoms or present to the hospital or unfortunately may not uh, survive the embolism. Just again, the next two slides do have trigger warnings. So I would like to show you what a clot actually looks like and excuse the, um, the comparison, but when you have a clot in the leg, it usually forms a mold of that vein, almost like a jello mold. And so when the clot dislodges, it will actually still keep the internal structure of that vein and dislodge almost like a snake that can be coiled up within the, um, the vein. 
that is really a bad situation because it doesn't allow the blood to flow around it, even if it was able to, and it gets lodged in the smaller aspect of the pulmonary arteries or right at the central portion of the pulmonary artery as it comes out of the heart, as you see here. So here is the heart right here. Here are your lungs on either side. And here is this sort of wrapped up snake or spaghetti-like clot that will sit right at um, the input into the lungs, the vascular input into the lungs and block all flow at that point. We call this a saddle embolism. You might hear that term. And I can show you here, this is the heart. This is that pulmonary um, artery right here. And this is just a clot that's been sort of teased out. So you can see that if you use your imagination, it can resemble sort of the ramifications of the vessel here within the deep veins of the leg. And here's another example of a clot that actually had a little bit more time to gel together and um, it is blocking just the right side, but it has almost like a snail-like appearance. These are the things that we look for in order to determine that the clot actually came from the lower extremities rather than somewhere else. Amy, can you just go back a slide for a second? Sure. So can you just give us, or you and or Rachel, some clarification on some terms here? So what a saddle embolism is versus say a bilateral pulmonary embolism versus a pulmonary embolism, just yes. so everybody knows what we're talking okay. about. Sure. So a saddle embolism is actually um, a term that's used because it resembles the way that a saddle sits on a horse. So this whole clot kind of has, oops, sorry, kind of has a curvature to it. And because it has that curve, it's completely blocking the main pulmonary artery as it goes into the right and left sides of the lung. By definition, that would be a saddle embolus. If that, that embolus sort of makes it past that, that initial piece of pulmonary artery and then goes into the right and left side, but the middle is open, that's usually just a right or a left-sided pulmonary embolism. You can have a very small pulmonary embolism just from a small piece that will go and travel farther into the vasculature of the lung. Those are usually just called pulmonary emboli. Um, and sometimes those are the ones that produce what we call like a herald symptom whereby the lung may actually get significantly damaged and cause a small amount of pain or fluid or some other symptom to develop. Usually these are not um, enough to cause a patient to die or anything of, the, of that sort, um, but they still can cause symptoms. Rachel, okay. I don't know if you wanna add anything. No, I think that's good. Okay, is that good, Leslie? I yes, guess I, the one thing I would add is, um, you know, when, when I have patients, oftentimes I'll, I'll pull up their scan so they can actually see it. And I equate, I equate it if they, to, to try and help people understand it to like a tree, right? <laughs> so you got a trunk of a tree and then you've got main branches, these two big main branches and then other branches and then other branches, other branches. And so I, I kind of say to patients, you know, think about if you had a blood clot at the trunk of the tree and you completely clot off all supply of nutrients and water and stuff, the tree would die. So that saddle PE, if that's completely occlusive, can be life-threatening. I mean, all PEs can be life-threatening. And then if you've got, you know, just the, on the right side or the left side, you've got main arteries and then you've got low bar, segmental, subsegmental. And so the farther out you go, the less likely that's going to be as life-threatening. But that saddle one or the right and main, what can happen is you get this buildup this, of this pressure, right, in the lungs. And so that's that's actually causing a lot of pressure onto the right heart, right, right side of the heart. And so one of the things that we look at in terms of you know, how severe somebody's blood clot is, whether they're straining that right side of their heart. And if they are straining that right side of the heart, that makes us quite nervous. <laughs> and oftentimes those people need more than just a blood thinner. Sometimes you need to go cut the clot out or shoot in some, some blood thinner, like a clot buster or suck it out. And so there's, you know, that's very uh, important to know kind of where, where it is, because that can have significant effects on how people do. Most people, if they have a saddle PE, you know, again, saddle PEs are, are quite dangerous. 
but oftentimes we'll see a saddle PE and there'll still be blood flow around it. Um, and so that, but still it's that strain in the heart that makes us very concerned. And then bilateral means it's just on both sides. You've got blood clots on both sides. Yeah, great, thank you. I think it's really helpful for people to kind of have that visual and also to see their scans. Thank you for doing that. I think that really helps people yeah. to understand what uh, what has happened. Yeah, and so. I would encourage you patients on the, on the uh, call to really ask your physician to take a look at it. Now, I always ask patients, do you want to see your scans? And sometimes people say yes, sometimes people say no, sometimes their loved one says yes and the patient says no, in which case <laughs> I have to honor the patient is what I always say afterwards if the loved one wants to stay back and the patient gives them permission. But but definitely ask because I think that helps you visualize kind of what it what's going on in your body. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Amy. Sorry. So yeah, so no problem. So one of the topics of this um, webinar was really to discuss sort of the relationship between obesity and venous thromboembolism. And, you know, measuring um, the amount of, of fat or adipose tissue, which is what fat is composed of in the body is extremely difficult. I report BMI on, on all of my cases. And, you know, I use it, you know, sort of in the sense that there's not a lot out there of an alternative. And it's just interesting to show how even in the in the common culture, this is from the New York Times in 2006, where they were encouraging everyone to sort of know your BMI, like your phone number. And then last week, there was an article about, you know, is BMI a scam and sort of drilling down on, you know, what is BMI? Why are we using it? And, and it, we don't have an alternative right now. But I think that for BMI, it's really meant as a population metric, not so much something that as an individual although you might have a certain BMI, it doesn't necessarily stop there. You're not, you know, you shouldn't necessarily just be labeled as obese, end of story, um, period. There are other things that, that can be looked into that can sort of clarify where exactly you might have excess um, fat or adipose tissue. So as Rachel mentioned before, there's a formula for obesity and then there's a stratification. Again, we use these to just sort of give us a general range in people whereby the, the metric is appropriate. So even for um, you know, people of certain ethnicity, East Asian, or even um, some areas of North America, some American Indian populations, BMI really is not, is not an appropriate um, you sort of measure of obesity because of the way that they carry their the adipose tissue in their body. Or for example, if you have a large amount of, of muscle, you may have sort of a very um, increased mass, but it's not representative of actual anatomic adipose tissue or fat. And therefore your BMI might actually be elevated, but you have really no cardiovascular risk factors um, that would go along with that. And this image right here, I'm sorry, I just have to move my thing. This image right here shows sort of some of the issues that come up with BMI. So here's a, you know, legitimately obese um, individual who may be metabolically healthy, meaning they have a, a healthy lifestyle or don't have diabetes or other things. And, you know, they do have some excess subcutaneous fat. And I'll show you on the next slide sort of we have to tease apart the different types of fat depots in the body to really understand which deposition of fat in the body is accounting for the large degree of risk that comes with having an elevated BMI. So can I just make another comment here? We, we had an interesting comment from somebody in the chat, Erica um, mentioned, you know, so, uh, why are physicians using BMI then if it's not really, you know, the end all be all? Is it is it that there's nothing else that exists out there? Well, you know, there's nothing else that's been studied. My understanding, and again, Rachel can also comment. My understanding is as of right now, we're using BMI on, let's just say, a public health scale to study populations, to give general um, information and data related to risk and specifically things like cardiovascular risk or thrombotic risk. It's the most studied and the most, and it's easy and it's cheap to measure. 
the other thing, the other ways of measuring things may be more invasive and difficult and might have some more sort of inter measurement variability. Um, and so as we move towards getting better at measuring obesity, maybe those things will change. But right now, you know, we are left with with BMI. It's not all bad, but um, you have to maybe marry it with other information. Okay. I personally hate the word. I wish there was a new word we could come up with. Yeah, I know. So I just wanted to sort of discuss a little bit um, the types of fat stores in the body. And there are three really main fat stores in the body. There's subcutaneous fat, which is right beneath your skin. And then there's intra-abdominal fat. Intra-abdominal fat is um, the fat that sort of is in between and around various parts of your body, including your colon and liver and kidneys. Then there's one last area of store, which is intramuscular fat. It's very difficult to show, but that is the sort of the third um, depot of fat. When we look at, let's just say this sort of visualization, um, imagine it was some sort of radiograph, you can even see sort of how there's the edges of subcutaneous fat right beneath the skin. Oops. Then there is the visceral cavity, which is sort of right at the edges of your rib cage and your pelvis. And as your visceral cavity is expanded by fat, it will change in size, usually from the front to the back. And so some people suggest that we use waist circumference as a better metric along with BMI to sort of think about how we might have more of a complex discussion of what obesity is. The other thing to note is that the differences between visceral fat and subcutaneous fat are many. Um, visceral fat is really the area in the body where excess amounts put you at increased risk for things like diabetes, metabolic syndrome, um, insulin resistance, and other inflammatory diseases, also um, VTE. Subcutaneous fat does not seem to confer that same risk, and it does not seem to be as metabolically active in the negative sense as visceral fat. And I think that it's important to note that obesity is not one note. And, um, you know, there can be many reasons for a person to have either increase in subcutaneous fat or increase in um, visceral fat. There may be treatment or surgery, surgical related reasons, dietary reasons, neuroendocrine reasons. You know, then there's social and behavioral reasons. Um, and then there's a whole host of genetic dysmorphic um, reasons where a patient might have a disorder of fat that will cause them to have excess amounts of visceral fat. So, you know, as we mentioned already, um, obesity does confer increased cardiovascular risk, increased risk for diabetes and things like sleep apnea. And visceral fat has a different metabolic profile than subcutaneous fat. I think right now what we don't necessarily know is does decreasing visceral fat cut your risk completely for um, VTE? And you know we're still sort of studying that extensively. I wanted to talk a little bit and sort of rip off of what um, Rachel said in terms of what this fat is doing. So I think sometimes people have an image in their mind of fat being this sort of, again, like, you know, um, quiet, you know, not to anthropomorphize, but, you know, quiet organ that doesn't necessarily do much. And in fact, it, it's the opposite. There's so much that, that adipose tissue does. It produces so many different types of compounds that relate to the clotting system um, in many ways in a negative way. And in patients that have increased visceral fat and may have things like metabolic syndrome, there's also increased fat in the liver and sometimes even in the bone marrow. And that can also increase, increase your risk. 
So it's the interplay between chronic inflammation that is produced either within or around the fat, as well as the um, inability to sort of dissolve any clot that may have formed that puts these people at increased risk. Mm -hmm. So this is just a summary slide of some of the substances that dysfunctional fat or fat found in patients that may have increased visceral fat will produce. Um, they may have levels of leptin, which is a, a you know sort of a marker that interplays between um, insulin. They may have increased levels of IL-6, which is sort of like a um, siren that alerts your body to pump out all kinds of inflammatory cells. Those two substances alone negatively interact with the thrombotic system and would put a person at increased risk of clotting. And unfortunately, when the fat gets quite large, some of the central areas of fat undergo, they die. And that dying process, because of lack of proper blood supply, will also cause inflammation in the fat. And that inflammation is just a very negative thing that will promote or sort of lean a person more on the slide of clotting rather than not. So this can go back and forth depending on the amount of sort of dysmorphic or increase in visceral fat. And as a person um, decreases their visceral fat compartment, you sort of get more on the side of preventing and lowering that inflammatory signal. So that is really actually a very good thing because it does show that as we you know, maybe lose some of that visceral fat compartment, we do have the ability to sort of decrease that, um, the likelihood of clotting. But as you go towards the increase in the dysfunctional fat or the visceral fat compartment, you, you not only may increase your um, risk of VTE, but as I mentioned before, other negative things like insulin resistance or um, development of things like metabolic syndrome or fatty liver disease. And all of those individually may confer a risk for increased clotting. So, you know, just in summary, I didn't talk much about, you know, why we clot, but, you know, um, you know, everyone on this um, webinar may may have some familiarity with it, known as Virchow's triad, you know, let me know if you want me to talk about that, <laughs> but obesity, <laughs> skip that part. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Obesity is, is a moderate independent risk factor for VTE. Um, and, you know, you see that risk increase with increasing BMI. And the risk in obese patients is, um, you know, higher in those over 50 than under 50. And inflammation is most likely going to be the link between the increased risk of patients that solely have obesity and thrombosis. So thank you very much. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's Amy, that, that was a great presentation. It's amazing to see the impact, uh, you know, with the pictures involved, because I think it just really helps send the message. Uh, it's, it's more clear, it's impactful when people can see that. Um, so, so great job. So a couple of questions for you. Um, if someone loses weight, so does the risk of developing another blood clot really decrease? Does it decrease a lot? Does it decrease a little bit? Um, and it, it, you know what happens if they gain the weight back after they've lost a bunch of weight? Does the incident level go back up, or is it worse than before they lost weight? You know that that yo-yo factor. How, how does that all play out? You know, I think Rachel could probably answer this question better than me. But what I can tell you is that, um, from you know what I'm aware of, is that sometimes that weight loss, if it's only in the subcutaneous regions. The, the BMI may change, but the risk may not. So mm -hmm. I think that's where, you know, some of the, the data and, the, and the, the science, you know, needs to sort of help us clarify that risk profile. Um, at, at least that's, that's what we see in the pathology, you know, arena in terms of patients that have, you know, saddle emboli or very large sudden um, unexpected pulmonary emboli. Rachel, I don't know if you want to comment um, on that. 
Yeah, I mean, I would say that many of the obesity related changes that we see that increase the risk of clot are, are absolutely reversible with weight loss. So I think, I think, you know, in my patients, you know, it's, it, there, there's a lot of, um, I think bias when thinking about obesity. And I mean, I look at obesity as just another medical problem like hypertension or high lipids or something like that. But there's a, there can be some um, stigma attached to it sometimes, I think. And, and again, kind of this implicit and explicit bias um, that can come out. But I think it's really important to talk with patients and, and people on the, on the um, webinar now um, if you do fall in that category of obese or severe obesity um, or even morbidly obese, um, I think it's important to talk with your provider about it. And I think a lot of providers may not may not broach the subject, but I always ask my patients, but I always, I'll, I'll just go back a step and say, I ask for permission to talk about it. You know, I ask them, can we, you know, one of the, one of the major risk factors might be your weight. Is that something, you know, you would feel comfortable talking to me about? And I've never had a patient say no. <laughs> That they would feel comfortable. And I, you got to take the shame out of it. And that's how, exactly how I approach it with people. And I, um, I have them then draw, I, I went to a great conference um, where one of our uh, heads of our um, weight management uh, center at our institution, they, they have patients draw a graph, you know, their, their, their weight and age. And as you get older, you know, you, you gain weight and then something happens where there's like a spike and then it might come down and then a spike again. Where people have gained weight is some event in their life. Had a birth, they got married, they got death, they lost their job, whatever it is, whatever the stress was. And then they've gained the weight and then they might try something where they lose the weight and they gain the weight again. And essentially they've kind of reset their thermostat is how, is how this, um, this lecture uh, uh, um, described it. And, and a lot of people think it's just diet and exercise, but it's actually a lot more than that. I think stress um, and cortisol levels and sleep play into this. And so it's really important, I think, to talk with your provider about it, if, especially if your provider doesn't bring it up. And I, and, and also I'll bring it up once. And oftentimes people will say, I want to try it on my own. I don't want your help. You know, I, 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 I've, I've been through it. I've been through the nutritionist. I know what to do. I just need to do it. And then at their follow-up visit, I'll say, you know, if they've lost weight, great. And if they haven't, I'll bring it up again. And I'll say, you know, we have a weight management program here. And um, until recently, you know, probably about five years ago, the only option we had for patients was surgery. But, you know, there's been an explosion in medications people can take now. And so there's a lot of different options people can have. And oftentimes it'll be the second, third, or even fourth follow-up where some will be like, okay, yeah, I, I would really like that. Yes, please refer me. So I think it's important to bring it up um, with your provider if you're comfortable enough. I think a lot of providers don't bring it up because they don't really know how to talk to patients about it. They might not know what the tools are that are out there or what the resources are out there. And I think it's a combination. It's not just, you know, medications. It's not just um, diet and exercise. It's, 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 it's a lot of different things, but the whole lifestyle management has to come into it and having, you know, having a coach, having somebody in a program that's really helping you uh, to, to do it, I think can be, can be really helpful for patients and really kind of, you know, talking about the successes and not, you know, look, you're going to have days where it works out and you're able to exercise. You're going to have days where, you know, you just feel like crap and you don't want to, and that's okay. <laughs> you know, well, and that's like, what, that, that, that's Rachel. That's what I hear a lot in the support groups is patients are made to feel bad by some of these yeah. doctors because of how yeah. they communicate with them. If everybody, if all the doctors communicated with their patients like you do, it would be less of a problem, but the communication and, and how doctors relate is just a really big deal. I yeah. think that, I think that the education is a little bit, yeah, I think it's more important, but I would, I would say to patients on the webinar, you know, if the first person that your first provider isn't, isn't giving you what you need, you need to keep looking and keep looking. find somebody yeah. that's going to help you. And because this is really, really, really important. And in fact, if you look at the risk obesity plays in VTE, it's kind of on the order of many of the other well-known risk factors. And in fact, in a, a recent large database that I looked at, it was a, it accounted for you know it was like a thirty-five percent increased risk when you had the obesity. So it's it's way up there. And there's yeah. and the thing about obesity is you can actually do something about it. Like an inherited thrombophilia, you're not getting rid of that, <laughs> right? You got factor five blood, and you're not getting rid of that. But obesity, there's actually things that that we can do as a as a community to help you 
Um, there's things that you can do to help yourself. I think that is one of the modifiable risk factors. And that's that's key that, that people understand that. So we have a bunch of questions. Um, I want to just keep the keep it moving because we don't have that much time left. And I do want to bring up some of the questions in the group. So, um, you know, what is the effect of losing weight when someone has hereditary thrombophilia? Is it enough to prevent an occurrence of a clot? So I think when you think about recurrence, you have to look at all the risk factors. And there's a lot of different um, uh, tools, um, scoring systems that you can use. But essentially, if you have a, a blood clot and you cannot identify the underlying cause, your risk of getting another blood clot is pretty high. So whether you have the inherited thrombophilia, whether you're overweight, whether you know X, Y, and Z, that is going to kind of trump everything. Um, it will affect um, kind of the dosing of the of the blood thinner, um, and we can talk about that in a little bit in terms of you know whether you can go down to a lower dose mm -hmm. if you're obese or not. But I think um, if you look at all the recurrent risks factor scoring systems, inherited thrombophilia is not in them, but um, so that's important to know, but it's really looking at all the risk factors you have and kind of weighing those risks to determine, you know, do you need to stay on an anticoagulant or can you get off? And if you're in that category where it was a provoked blood clot and it was, you know, a major transient risk factor that caused it um, and you got rid of that risk factor, then you may not need to be on a long-term blood thinner. I think if you have the inherited thrombophilia and you're severely obese, I would, even if it was a provoked blood clot, there's been studies that show if you have ongoing risk factors that there's benefit to staying on blood thinner. So I would be a little bit nervous um, about taking somebody off if they had multiple risk factors like that, but that would be a conversation I would have the patient and really do some shared decision-making and kind of weigh the risks and benefits. How horrible is it for you to be on the, on the anticoagulant? How terrified are you going to be when you get off? And yeah, um, you know, you can be able to live point. your life. And again, looking at all the risks and and figuring out how how those risks are playing into what is your ultimate risk of getting a blood clot if we stop your blood thinner versus your risk of bleeding if we keep you on it. So I think you got to take all those factors into consideration. Yeah, great, great points. Um, how can um, physicians providers determine if their patient has an increase of visceral fat versus subcutaneous fat? There's not really great measurements. I mean, there's CT scans and MRIs that can be done. And I think that, you know, those are um, expensive and, um, you know, they have radiation. So at least CT has radiation associated with them. Waist circumference, I think, w combined with BMI is probably the best um, method without sort of invasive imaging, you know, quote unquote, invasive imaging studies. Okay, great. Um, Amy, that was a amazing presentation. Thank you so much You're for welcome. showing that. And, Thanks and for having me. Yours, yours too. Um, we're really thankful for both of you to be able to educate us like this. So, um, so Rachel, Rachel, I'm going to come back to you again for a kind yeah. of a multi-part question. Um, so when a patient comes to you and they need to lose weight and possibly considerable weight, I know you have a conversation with them, but what is your actual protocol in terms of having that conversation? And are there new weight loss tools that are out there that are available for people? You know, some folks have had bariatric surgery, but not everybody wants to go that route. And we're talking really obese. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, what else is out there? And then talk to us about treating patients with a blood thinner um, for those patients who uh -huh. are obese. You know, uh -huh. are there weight guidelines? Uh -huh. does, the doses cha does the dosage change as their weight changes? Uh -huh. um, or is it kind of like, here you go, this is what you get? Oh, yeah. Oh, and just to answer the question, I was looking at the question, the effect of losing weight when you also have the inherited thrombophilia, is that enough? I just want to go back to that. I think um, if you, if the two risk factors you have was a provoked blood clot and you were obese and you have inherited thrombophilia, and then you're no longer obese and the only thing left is the inherited thrombophilia, then it depends on what that inherited thrombophilia is and, and how significant I'm concerned about that um, potentially increasing your risk. And so um, I just want to make <laughs> clarify that. Um, so mm -hmm. I think in terms of the protocol, um, we don't really have a protocol, I would say. And that's, I think, one of the issues that I'm not aware of like a, a protocol that we give in our follow-up clinics. I, I think we do encourage everybody to ask the question and then we need to provide some guidance on, on, on what to do in asking the question. I think in terms of the tools, there's so many things out there. And fortunately, we have a weight management program um, that we can offer our patients, which is kind of multidisciplinary. It's not just 
you know, there's surgery that people can have, there's medications, there's nutrition, there's lifestyle, there's exercise. Uh, there's a lot of different things people can do. Um, sometimes they, um, you know, ac acupuncture and meditation. I mean, there's lots of different ways to, uh, to think about that. So I think if it's not something you have in your own, you know, for providers, they don't have it in their own system, but really to ask your provider, you know, what, what are the programs that are out there for me that I can, that I can do and, um, and really get, if you need a referral to do that. I think in terms of your last question, in terms of the medications, this is a really important question for people to know. Um, so in 2016, there was something called the International Society of Thrombosis Hemostasis, and they published actually guidelines about using direct oral anticoagulants in obese patients. So we used to use Coumadin, that was the that was the, the standard uh, drug, but in the last you know 20 years now, these rivaroxaban, apixaban, edoxaban, uh, dibigatran are all drugs that were compared to Coumadin and found to be just as effective in preventing blood clots, but they were better in terms of bleeding. And so in 2016, this guidance document came out that said, actually, there's not enough data to say it's okay, that it's safe or effective to use these DOACs in obese patients, i.e. if you were over 120 kilos or you had a BMI greater than 40. However, last year in 2021, the uh, uh, guidelines were updated because there's now actually very good data to support the use of DOAX, in particular, apixaban and rivaroxaban in obese patients. So now if you have a BMI over 40 or you're greater than 120 kilos, there's actually good data and the, these guidelines now say uh, that is okay to use these drugs. Um, now, if someone has had, uh, in terms of the dosing, so, so I have no problem using these drugs in patients um, now who are obese. Now, if somebody has a BMI that's you know greater than 60, sometimes I get a little bit of nervous, but I'll think about checking levels in that patient. In terms of going down to a lower dose, as you may or may not know, people on the call, that there's two studies, one with rivaroxaban and one with apixaban, that demonstrated that after being on full dose blood thinner for six to 12 months, that it's both safe and effective to go down to what's called the prophylactic or the lower dose. Now, the guidelines looked at this, and there's really actually not any data uh, to say that it's safe or effective to go down to the lower dose in patients uh, with a BMI greater than 40 or a weight greater than 120. So I tend to not go down to the lower dose. I tend to keep them on the, what we call the therapeutic dose. But what I say to the patients in both of those studies, that patients were randomized to the therapeutic dose, the prophylactic dose, and then the third arm was a, was a baby aspirin, and then uh, in the rivaroxaban arm, and then the apixaban, it was placebo. But I want to point out to the patient that there was no statistically significant difference in major bleeding between any of them. So it's reassuring to me, and it's actually okay to stay on that higher dose um, in my obese patients. So I think um, these drugs should absolutely be used. And even though these guidelines came out a year ago, I still think there's a lot of providers that are not aware of these guidelines. And Leslie, you know, we did an expert panel about this and I wrote it up and it's hopefully going to be published soon um, to really help people, uh, providers in particular, understand that actually these drugs are safe. So for people on the call, if you are obese, um, whatever category you are in, um, there is good data to suggest uh, that using one of these is safe and effective. And if you're still on uh, Coumadin or Warfarin, definitely talk to your provider about switching over. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Talk back to you. I, hey, and, and Rachel, uh, while I've got you on, you're you're the hematologist in the room, and we've talked <laughs> all, we've we've talked a lot about obesity and the risk that that brings. But there's also something else that we need to talk about that I think people uh, uh, they have questions about, and that is about compression, okay? Oh. Um, so what I'd like to know is what does what exactly does compression do for you? Who needs them and why? Um, what is the difference between medical grade and non-medical grade compression mm -hmm. stockings? Mm -hmm. And should people even, should they consider seeing a vascular specialist? But tell us a little bit about compression. How does that help? Yeah, yeah. So compression stockings are like pantyhose or tights, and they can be made from different material. And what they do is they have this elastic fi fabric that is designed to fit very tight kind of around the ankles, legs, and thighs. And um, so what they do is the pressure that they create kind of pushes the fluid up your leg, which allows the blood flow to flow more freely from the leg to the heart. And so they improve blood flow, but they also can help uh, reduce swelling and pain. 
Um, and oftentimes they're recommended to prevent blood clots in high clotting risk situations because the pressure stops the blood from like pooling and clotting. So that's kind of what they are in terms of, they, they come in different levels of tightness. Um, and so they're, they're also different sizes. So it can be knee high, it can be thigh high, um, it can be one leg, you can both legs, it can be a chap. And so if you're thinking about, um, definitely ask your doctor if you've had it, what's called a deep vein thrombosis, and you have a lot of swelling, you might want to ask your doctor about using those. Um, there's different um, strengths. Um, it comes in uh, millimeters of mercury is the measure of the pressure. And so the stockings with the higher numbers have higher pressure. So they come in um, 15 to 20, 20 to 30, um, and 30 to 40. I think it's very hard for people to do the 30 and 40. It's very hard to get them on. Um, but really the right amount of tightness is going to be kind of something that you're going to you know, talk with your provider about. Um, and then there's lots of different brands that you can use too. Unfortunately, insurance companies only cover the 30 to, actually only cover, I think, beyond, yeah, 30 to 40 um, or 40 and beyond. Sorry, there's also 40. So it's very hard to get insurance companies to, to actually cover them. Um, but mm -hmm. the, generally you can to figure out, you measure the circumference of your, of your ankle and then the widest part of your calf and then the calf length. And so you, there's ways to measure to see which ones, which ones um, can help. And really, you know, the thought behind them is, um, is that they can uh, potentially, you know, decrease swelling, increase the blood flow, decrease pain. Um, there's actually been uh, lots of studies kind of looking at compression stockings as to whether or not it does change management. And the, the thing that we worry about is something called post-thrombotic syndrome. So when people have a blood clot in their legs, they've injured the vessels. And so you can kind of get um, pressure and reflux in that vessel. And that can lead to leg pain, leg swelling, um, uh, skin changes, um, heaviness, the leg feels really heavy, um, numbness and tingling, even ulcers. And so, um, you know, the thought is, could these compression stockings help with that? And unfortunately, the, the data that's out there now isn't definitive in that it may or may not. There is some, uh, some studies going on now that are looking at it to see whether or not um, that's going to be very helpful. There's also other things you can do, um, uh, sometimes uh, surgery, sometimes they, you know, can suck the clot out so they, they can, you know, shoot a clot buster in there. Um, but the level of evidence regarding how effective they are um, to prevent uh, VTE is, is fairly low. But having said that, they are commonly used uh, in clinical practice to prevent PTS after a DVT. Um, and so what I tend to do is if somebody does have pain and swelling, I absolutely will tell them to wear the compression stockings. So I tell them to put them on in the morning, take them off at night. And if they are having, you know, a significant pain and swelling, I will often have them uh, go and see my vascular uh, medicine um, colleague to see if they are um, potentially candidates for something else, you know, like a, like an intervention. It's really important to do it right off the bat too, not to like wait three months and then start using them. Um, but again, the data behind it is is, is not robust and, and and is a little bit conflicting. Uh, but but I do think uh, that's important. I also tell people to raise their leg above their heart for at least fifteen minutes every night. I think that's very important. I think hydration is important. Exercise. I cannot emphasize how important exercise is um, in helping a lot of people. Will think, oh my god, I got a blood clot. I got to sit, you know, and not do anything all day. And that's absolutely not the case. And I get a lot of questions you know, how much can I exercise? When can I start to exercise? You know, can I go on a run? Can I, you know, do this? And I tell people, you know, obviously you want to meet with your provider and make sure you're cleared to, st to start exercise, especially ones where if you've had a blood clot in your lungs, where your heart rate's going to go way up. Uh, but in, in general, I tell people um, to start slow and small amount and then just build up because I don't want somebody to, you know, go uh, take a, uh, you know, a half an hour walk after having been in the hospital, you know, for a week uh, and then come back and collapse on the couch and not be able to get up for several hours. So I think you got to know your body and not put, you know, not just allow yourself that time to gradually build up um, on your exercise. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. We have a couple of comments here. Uh, Lisa, thank you. She has a PTS and said that compression socks allow her to function uh, mostly normally. So that's great to hear. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then another question, um, what is the effect of compression socks when flying uh, and taking aspirin? Does it help? Gosh, we know a lot of patients and actually um, flight attendants who uh, actually do wear compression socks when they're when they're traveling. But an opinion on that, Rachel? 
Yeah. So actually um, a year ago, I think maybe a year or two ago, there was something called a Cochrane review where they take a bunch of studies with a bunch of different people and they kind of look at all of them and come up to, they to try to, to distill them into a, um, into, you know, are they effective? Is this effective or not? And so they took 12 studies with almost 3000 patients um, and they, um, they looked and it was actually looking at compression stockings for a flight that lasted more than five hours. And they found that like half of them did, half of them didn't. So none of the passengers developed that they looked at developed any DVTs with symptoms, which means that they had like pain, like swelling, things like that. And there were no serious events and no blood clots to the lungs. But there was actually evidence that suggested that um, the airline passengers, um, uh, that their incidence of uh, sim asymptomatic DVT was lower. <laughs> so, cause um, some of the studies looked at like uh, ultrasounds right after people got off the airplane. Um, and so, but oftentimes those asymptomatic DVTs might not do anything. So, um, and then there's a very low certainty of evidence that it helped with uh, the swelling. Um, and, but it was, you know, it was limited by the way that the swelling was measured. And then there was kind of moderate evidence that actually superficial um, blood clots were reduced. So Amy did a nice job of showing you where the deep vein blood clots were. You also have what's called superficial veins. And so um, the compression stockings did, there was kind of moderate certainty evidence that it helped with that. Um, so I would say to people, you know, my, my patients that have had a blood clot, a deep, a deep vein thrombosis and have swelling or have pain or got a blood clot after a flight or something like that, I will often have patients wear compression stockings because I think there's not really any downside to wearing the compression stockings. I will have, I tell people to wear the compression stockings, keep themselves very well hydrated, you know, try to get up and walk around if they can. And if they can't do little leg exercises um, at their sure. chair, I do tell people not to take a sleeping pill on airplanes. You can sleep like if it's in, you know, um, a, a, a flight that's very long, but sleeping pill, you know, think about immobility at its finest, right? A sleeping pill will do that for you. Uh, but I do think it's, there's benefit. I, I actually have a lot of my patients wear compression stockings on flights. Yeah. And great. then in terms okay. of the aspirin, there's kind of low evidence of aspirin. If you look at the ASH guidelines, low, low evidence um, uh, of aspirin with flights too. But again, if you if you have significant risk factors, it's certainly something to consider. And I would also say in patients that have had a provoked blood clot, and then they've stopped their blood thinner because you've taken away the provoking cause, in high clotting risk situations, it's really important to talk with your doctors about when you might need to go back on a low dose blood thinner. And oftentimes long flights will be times that I put people back on a blood thinner because that is another potentially high clotting risk situation. Yeah, no, great point. I had this conversation with a patient today. He was uh, unprovoked and he travels a lot and he wears his compression socks. Um, but when he travels very long distances, they put him back on uh, an anti Yeah, I do that so. with a lot of my patients. So again, just I think the most important thing is really having open conversations uh, with your provider, you know, knowing what your risks are, knowing, do I need to stay on a blood thinner? Can I stay on the dose that I'm on? Am I a candidate to go to a lower dose? Am I a candidate to come off the drugs? If I'm a candidate to come off the drugs, do I need to be put on aspirin full time? Um, do I need to be put back on the blood thinner in certain situations? And if the, what are those situations? So I think really having a good understanding of um, all these questions to ask your provider. Okay. So um, we're going to end here with the questions. I'm sorry that we can't get to everybody, but we've actually run over and we want to be mindful of the time. Um, we are going to do the polling questions, but before we move to the polling questions, uh, on behalf of all of us, thank you to Amy and to Rachel. This has been fantastic. Um, your presentations were amazing. We also want to thank again our sponsor for this evening, which is Cardinal Health. Um, their sponsorship allows NBCA to continue to bring educational content to our patient community. So thank you very much. We greatly appreciate that. Um, Todd is actually going to close this out with another short poll. So Todd, I'm going to punch it back to you. Yeah, a couple of quick questions, folks, just like you did in the beginning. Just answer them real quick. Um, it's important that we know this stuff. Uh, number one, do you feel more confident uh, in how to lower, adjust, and overcome your risk for a, a VTE recurrence? Yes, somewhat or no. Uh, what is the overall satisfaction rate with this pep talk? Very satisfied, satisfied, not satisfied, very unsatisfied. Julia might put up the link to uh, get some stop the clot gear. You see, I'm wearing my beanie. I got my sweatshirt on. <laughs> it's kind of nice to go around and raise some awareness and do it in some cool looking duds. And also she might put the link up if you guys want to join a support group. Uh, come to the NBCA Team Stop the Clot support group. We like to uh, uh, hang out with you guys and talk. So uh, uh, do that, please.
And here are the results. Do you feel more confident in how to lower, adjust, and overcome your risk for VTE recurrence? 56% said yes, 36% said somewhat, only 8% did say no. And what is your overall satisfaction rate uh, with this pep talk? 59% uh, said they were very satisfied and 38% said that they were satisfied. 3% said they were not satisfied. And we're sorry about that. Uh, very unsatisfied, 0%, thank goodness. So thanks for answering <laughs> that, folks. Good night, everybody. Good night.